It's the million dollar question. What's a better investment? The stock market shares or, or property? Now, outside superannuation, which all Australians now have to have, property and shares are the two most common ways Australians build wealth. Some find deciding which to invest in is a bit of a hard decision. We're going to unpack that today, so at the end of today's show, you're going to know which is right. Now, by the way, if somebody says only property, only property, 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 or somebody says only shares, that's the only way to go, run away very fast because they've got a vested interest. So you'll find at different stages of your life, at different times when you need asset growth or cash flow, different sorts of investment will be more suitable for you. So in today's show, with our regular guest, Pete Wargent, we're going to tell you the pros and cons of both the asset classes, and we're going to explain when they're right for you and when maybe you shouldn't be investing in a particular asset class. Now, that's what you need to know if you want to grow your wealth, isn't it? So welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. It's an age-old question. Which is a better investment, property or shares? Now, this is a topic that's often debated in the media, online, and the conclusions usually depend on the preconceptions and the prejudices of the people who are making those conclusions. I bet if you ask Donald Trump, he'd say property is the only road to riches. On the other hand, if you ask Warren Buffett, he'd tell you you could become financially free investing in the right shares. So who's right and which investment is right for you? That's what I want to chat today about with Pete Wardent, one of Australia's most respected financial and housing market analysts. Welcome, Pete. Pleasure, Michael. Now, it should be fairly obvious by now that I believe income-producing residential real estate is a great option for the average Australian. So, Pete, which way do you lead, property or shares? Well, there's a place for both. They're two, uh, essentially, I see them as very different but complementary asset classes. But they, even though the long-term performance may be similar, um, as asset classes, they're actually very different. So... Um, to a certain extent, I think it depends on your stage in life. Uh, but the tax system in Australia really pushes people into property and shares. Uh, in other parts of the world, they might look at fixed income investments. But I think given where interest rates are likely to be for the next 10 years, Australians will be very much skewed towards real estate and equities. Um, and how you make that balance work for you really comes down to personal preference and the stage you're at in your journey. So look, there's a place for both. I like property just as you do. Um, if you've got a decent runway and a, a long time horizon, then the extra leverage that you can use in property is very attractive. On the share market side of things, that market is much more liquid, so it's easy to get your money at short notice, and it's also better for generating income. So there's there's arguments on both sides of the fence. Now, most people invest in property because they think they know about property. They've lived in one, they've rented one, so they think they know about it. We know that's wrong. Just because you know your local area doesn't mean you know how property investment works. And others actually tend to forget that they already have a share portfolio we all have to have a superannuation fund, a uh, self-managed super fund for a few people, but the majority it's your employer contributes 9% and that'll increase of your income to your superannuation, and that's in the stock market. But Pete, let's have a look at some of the reasons why I like property as an investment. One of the main reasons I do is I see it as an imperfect market. In other words, in the share market, I can buy the shares at the same price as the big institutions or, or the stockbrokers, but in property... I can have a, an edge partly related to my knowledge, my information, my contacts. Um, and I can buy a property below market price or at a good price anyway. So I, I actually like the fact that property is an imperfect market. 
Yes, that's definitely true. So we've, we've talked in previous podcasts about the idea of an efficient market. And I think at the asset class level, that is fairly true. You know, the market is fairly efficient most of the time. But when you get down to the suburb level and down to the street level, and you would have local knowledge about zoning rules, about where you might be able to subdivide a block, um, ideas of how you can add value to property, you've got a real edge on the average investor because unlike in the stock market, which is 100% comprised of investors, the everyday person in the housing market is just somebody looking to buy a home. So you can definitely find an edge on the average participant. Then you can, of course, use that to your advantage. Of course, that's another reason I like the property market because it's actually controlled not by investors like all other investment classes. And that gives it a level of stability because uh, it's a fundamental human requirement. While companies and the shares in those companies come and go, houses, they're there. You need the uh, roof over your head. And as long as you buy in the right location, the value isn't going to disappear like it has in some stocks, Pete. No. So, I mean, it's one of the reasons that people, you know, if you've got a good property or a good block that's close to the centre of Sydney or Melbourne, well, people take the view that, look, if you came back in 20 or 50 or 100 years' time, um, that land is fixed in place, it's not going anywhere, and that gives people a great deal of confidence. Now, in the stock market, um, the average life of a company is surprisingly short these days before the company becomes illiquid, uh, sorry, insolvent or goes bankrupt or it gets merged or taken over. And so a company might only be around for 10 or 15 years. And that makes it a bit scarier for people because the last thing you want to do in investing is invest in something that goes to zero because that's a permanent loss of capital. So these days, what a lot of investors look to do in the stock market is actually own the whole index or a whole sector of the index. Uh, It gives them a bit more comfort that they're not investing in something that's just going to disappear on them. Well, that's one of the advantages of the stock market because you can buy smaller clumps of shares while in property it is lumpy and there are expensive entry costs and reasonably expensive ongoing costs with rates and taxes and maintenance as well. So some people would say the diversification of the stock market is an advantage. Uh, Yes, it is. I mean, it's easier to break up your investments into Let's say you could have a dozen separate investments in the stock market. That's easier. That's easy to do. You can also diversify by um, by actually owning ETFs that own a whole index instead of individual stocks. And you can also diversify over time because, as you mentioned, you don't have the transaction costs, so you can you can stage your entry to an investment. So there's lots of ways you can diversify in stocks. In property, you're making far fewer but much bigger decisions. And that's why we always advocate uh, you, somebody with local knowledge and market expertise, because if you're only making a handful of decisions in property, you want to make sure that you get them right. Interestingly, a report just out this week by the University of Sydney and Tasmania showed that two-thirds of property investors get it wrong because they invest in their own backyard. And it showed that despite people thinking they know what was going on because they bought close to where they lived. The study showed it did not give them an investment advantage. If anything, they overpaid for their properties. So you're right, because property is lumpy, you can't get it wrong. You've got to get good advice. One of the other things I like about it, and we hinted at that a moment ago, was that you can leverage against it. And while you can leverage against shares, not as much as property Uh, where you can put a smaller amount of your money down and the bank doesn't benefit from a share of the increased value of your asset. Yeah, so if you looked at the the total returns from uh, Australian equities versus Australian property, over the 20 financial years to 2017, uh, property actually outperformed even ungeared. Now, we have had a two-year downturn, so those returns are probably uh, now shares will be slightly ahead over the 20 years. But the thing is, in property, as you rightly mentioned, um, people can leverage those returns maybe five five or 10 times. So that's really where for the average investor with a decent time horizon, that's where the real advantage comes in. Now, you you may not want to take on 
uh, large leverage um, late in life. But if you're a younger person and the bank um, can magnify your returns from real estate over a, a 15 or 20 or 30 year time horizon, to me, that's a no brainer. Uh, make use of the leverage. And that's really why there are more real estate millionaires than there are stock market millionaires. It's the combination of leverage and compound growth that's so powerful over the long run. There's no other investment vehicle provided where you can get 80% leverage uh, against your asset. Uh, and the other thing is, if you do leverage your stocks, you know that uh, the bank is going to come knocking on your door and asking for you to top up more if the value of your stock drops. Well, in properties in general, even during the slump of the property market a lot, last couple of years, the banks didn't come and ask people to top up their loans like they would with margin calls. No, it's, a, it's, it's actually a unique triumvirate of lending conditions that relate to resi property. And the third one um, is that you can uh, borrow at low rates. So, I mean, these days, I mean, who knows, over the, the next 12 months, people will be borrowing with a two in front of their mortgage. In, in Britain, we've seen that already for years. Uh, generally speaking, for other assets, uh, the bank will demand a higher rate of interest to compensate for the risk. Um, so you can borrow for very long terms at very low rates and with higher levels of leverage with no margin calls. Uh, so it does make Resi Real Estate a unique asset class in terms of the ability to use leverage. Yeah, I've always said it's funny that the National Australian Bank won't lend you to borrow, uh, buy their own shares <laughs> as easily as they will to buy uh, properties. But another thing that I love about properties is the fact that you can add value. I can't go to a West Farmers and say, hey, at the coal supermarket, put the fabulous on the top shelf because it's going to sell better. I haven't got a say in what's going on there. But if my property isn't performing well, I can improve it, I can add value, I can change the property manager, uh, I, I can do things to it. Um, and uh, that's, in my mind, another advantage of residential real estate. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure there'll be some people listening to this who've, um, they, they rent where they live, they only invest in shares and they're super, and they'll be, they'll be dubious about um, the benefits of property. Well, you've touched on a really important one there. Uh, take, take the example of, Let's say you buy an old house in Melbourne, which you can knock down. Um, you can subdivide the block and put two new houses or a duplex on there. Uh, the tax benefits of doing that are uh, tremendously favourable in Australia. So not only are you adding value by subdividing the block and creating two blocks of land, then you're constructing new properties for people to live in. And then you get very, very favourable on, on paper deductions in terms of depreciation. So that's not money out of your pocket. That's money. That's just a, an on paper deduction you can put on your tax return. Plus, you've got negative gearing benefits and you've got a capital gains tax discount. So if you know the rules of the game, uh, you can make property work for you very, very favourably. Um, I suspect that the average investor doesn't really understand all the nuances, but for experienced investors and you, know, you guys have been doing it for decades uh, when you know all of those ins and outs um, property is quite a unique investment well, that's why when we sit with a client at metropole we spend time talking about where they want to go and we put a finance strategy and ownership strategy together because the finance sees them through the ups and downs the ownership and tax strategy helps make sure that they take advantage of what I like calling loopholes, even though they're not really their actual a raft of legal tax deductions, because the government wants us to be property investors. It actually doesn't want to provide public housing to that 30% of Australians who rent properties, not necessarily because they haven't got uh, the financial wherewithal to own a house. It's really just because of their lifestyle choices. So the government actually wants us to be property investors, doesn't it, Pete? Yeah. If you actually look at the public sector approvals, uh, they've, they've never been as low as they are today. So essentially, the government has stopped supplying new housing stock. And in fact, if you account for the stuff that gets demolished, um, they're, they're not adding any stock uh, to the housing market. So the private sector has to provide rental property. So um, you know, some people say, oh, well, property investors get these advantages, these benefits. They ain't going away because somebody has to provide the rental stock. Um, now, 
There's some talk about um, bringing institutions into the sector, but by and large, actually, institutions don't want to do it. Um, the rent, the, the yields aren't high enough to compensate for the, the property management time that goes in for a big institution. So it really comes down to private sector landlords supplying rental housing. And that's why, um, as you said, um, the, the government wants investors in the market. We did go through a very short spike during the Rudd stimulus where the government built some housing. Uh, but apart from that, it's just an uninterrupted uh, multi-decade downtrend. And now it's all about private landlords. Well, I think another thing is you've got to look at the results others have achieved. And if, as you said earlier on, the majority of Australians have got their wealth in property, and we see that every month when the Reserve Bank brings out its chart pack, that the wealth of Australians has over the long term increased. Yeah, we had a little dip recently as property values dropped, and it's increased because they own assets, they own property and they own shares. But according to the BRW Rich 200 list, Property has consistently been the major source of wealth for Australia's multi multi millionaires, billionaires. And those who invested and made their money in business then took their cash out of it and put it into property as well. So why fight it? Why not do what the others successful people have done? But Pete, when you get to the next stage, once you've built your asset base, then there definitely is a room for cash flow, a need for cash flow, and that's where a mixture of shares and property seems to be beneficial. Yeah, look, and that's what we tackle in our coaching programs. We try and encourage people uh, to think about financial independence. It's a term that gets banded around a lot, but it doesn't really have a set definition. But what, the way we look at it is that, well, you need you need a 12-month buffer because if you haven't got that, you can't be – financially independent. You need your long-term investments, uh, which might form part of your legacy so that they can just grow and compound away for as long as you live and uh, all being well, you can pass those on to your children. But then you probably need a two to five-year pot of funds uh, where maybe you actively manage your own money uh, and that can cover uh, holidays, car upgrades, whatever else, your your living costs. And that's I think that's really where the stock market has a good role to play uh, because if you can actively manage your money in the markets and it's liquid so you can get that money whenever you need it, uh, that to me is what financial independence really is. Um, so property, I see, ideally is a long-term investment because it's always performed so well. And just looking at the, as you know, I follow a lot of demographic trends and social trends. Just looking at what's happening in Sydney. I've been down in Sydney for the past week. All of the big tech companies going into the centre of the city. Uh, retirement living is moving from the sticks into the centre of the city. Uh, housing is going to keep performing in Australia in those big capitals uh, for the very long term. So that's why I like property as a long term investment. If you need some liquid funds, that's where the stock market can come in. Makes a lot of sense because. They're two very different asset classes. So it is difficult to compare in, in a meaningful manner. And as we said, you can get good leverage with property, get good leverage to a different degree with shares. Uh, but the truth is that equities are a wonderful asset class if you treat them right, if you know what to do. But most Australians don't. They don't understand. So just like with property, it's important to get the right advisors around you. If you try and do it on your own, Peter, which I did years ago. I actually remember I bought my first shares uh, before I was old enough to own them. I got them bought in my grandmother's name. I remember that the other day. I bought some shares called Westralian Sands for three cents and they went up to four cents. And I actually made 25% on my money overnight. And I thought I was really, really smart. Um, and that, that was during uh, one of the speculative uh, stock market bubbles way back when I was a, a teenager. So I've been much more careful in the shares that I have in my portfolio nowadays and they're in my super funds. So I have a mix of both. I know you do as well. And we've done a separate podcast on this a short while ago about how you fund retirement. So at the moment, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about that. But if you're interested in that, go listen to the archives of the Michael Yardley podcast. Go to michaelyardleypodcast.com or look on 
Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to these, and have a listen to Pete and my chat about how to fund your retirement because I think uh, you'll get some great information from that as well. Pete, I love having you on these podcasts once a fortnight. Look forward to catching up with you real soon. But if people want to find out more about what you do or follow your great articles or blogs, where will they find out about you? Uh, two easy places. Firstly, my daily blog, uh, Pete Wardgen Blogspot, really easy to find on Google. And the other place, if you enjoy my free videos, is gonextlevelwealth.com.au. And there's some details there about our coaching programs and so on as well. Perfect. And of course, we'll have those details in the show notes. So if you haven't remembered them, go to the show notes wherever you're listening to this podcast and you'll get the details. Thanks a lot, Pete. Look forward to catching up with you again in a couple of weeks' time. Pleasure. It's always good fun. Cheers. In a moment, I'm going to share with you my mindset moment, a fun session about pulling out the thorn. You'll understand what it is in just a moment. But before we get on with that, I'd like to remind you that it's that time of the year again. It's coming up to when I'm doing my annual round of seminars in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, the National Property Market and Economic Updates. And since you're listening to my podcast, I'm giving you a special gift. You can come for free by putting in the coupon code podcast. Now, we only conduct this once a year. Dr. Andrew Wilson, Australia's leading housing market economist, will be there. Ken Race, my business partner at Metropole Wealth Advisory, will be there. Local property experts and finance experts. We're going to tell you what you need to do differently at this stage of the property cycle to take advantage of the new property cycle, because this cycle is going to be different to previous times. You're going to have some idea since you've been listening to my podcast. We're going to bring you all the latest research about what's happening all around Australia and what you can do. In fact, I'm going to share with you exactly what I'm doing. So go to propertymarketupdate.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, propertymarketupdate.com.au. Use the coupon code podcast and you and a friend can come as my guest. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's mindset message, I'm going to repeat something that I mentioned in a show a year or two ago because it's a great lesson it's a great story so I want you to imagine what would happen if you had a thorn caught in your arm this thorn is pierced right on a nerve with the slightest contact you're going to suddenly find pain shoots throughout your entire body so in order for you to live without pain you make every attempt to ensure nothing touches the thorn you create a pad around it to protect your arm. It's not comfortable to wear it asleep in, but you put up with it because it prevents the pain. You plan every area of your life so that nothing touches the thorn and you put all your energy and focus in how you're going to be free from troubles from the thorn. But are you really? In the book, The Untethered Soul, author Michael Singer uses this analogy to show that in reality, all this person has done is cover up the problem. And by doing so, they've built their entire life around the problem. Of course, the alternative is to simply remove the thorn. Now, we all have internal thorns that we've built up. We've built up in our life in various ways. We bury our childhood traumas, our fears, our emotional insecurities. Whenever something touches these internal thorns, rather than letting them rise to the surface, rather than us experiencing them, rather than facing them head on, we tend to bury them deeper by distracting ourselves from the pain, by convincing ourselves they're not there. You are not your fears. You create your fears. Why is it that some people are scared of needles and blood and yet doctors and nurses work with them all day? The same goes for snakes, for, for spiders, for door knocking, for cold calling, for salespeople. There's another thorn many people have. The fear of rejection. But fear of rejection is a notion that exists in itself. You can't fill a bucket with rejection. You create the fear by giving it meaning. As motivational speaker Jack Canfield says, everything you want is on the opposite side of fear. It's time now to have a brutally honest conversation with yourself. What are you afraid of? What's causing you paralysis? What people or conversations have you been avoiding? 
What would life look like if you confronted your fears? If you grew past them, what would your relationships be like? What would your business be like? So now you have two choices. Build your life around accommodating your fears or face your fears so they're never going to bother you again. My suggestion to you is to pull out that door. Well, thanks for joining me again on the twice a week Michael Yardley podcast. Pete Wardgen gave us some great information about property versus shares, and I hope you're going to have a better understanding of where the different asset classes suit you. But remember what I said a short while ago, it's time for my annual property market updates, and you can join us as my guest by using the coupon code podcast at propertymarketupdate.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, but you should come along to find out why this coming property cycle is different, how you can take advantage of it, how you can learn from the past and from Australia's leading experts, including Dr. Andrew Wilson, Ken Race, a range of local property experts, and me, of course, propertymarketupdate.com.au, the coupon code podcast. Now, if you got some benefit from this show, please help me in my quest to make more people financially independent by passing the message on, telling somebody about it or leaving a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to this podcast. But at the bottom of every podcast app, there's a share button of some sort. So please tell others about it because let's together help more and more of us become financially fluent. And I'm doing that obviously regularly through my daily property update newsletter where you get a lot of information from Australia's leading experts in property, tax, finance, wealth, success. And twice a week, I'm going to bring you this show. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?